Right, so we're going to go into this message and um, before then, can we just take some time to pray? Uh, can we take some time to pray? How many of you want to pray? Back in the day when I was in secondary school, they would sing a song where we want to pray in the class because I went to a, a Christian school and the school was the best school in my state, proud of that. Um, so they would sing, we want to pray, we want to pray. Close your eyes, <laughs> close your eyes, put your hands together, put your hands together, say your prayer. Anyway, we are not going to sing that song, but we're going to pray to a God who listens. So do you want to bow down your, your heads and just uh, speak to God and ask God for an infilling of the Spirit of God. Ask for freshness. Ask that God would fill you up with strength and grace. The book of thought, John says, Beloved, I wish you above all things that thou, be, thou would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Ask, the, ask for the prosperity of the soul. Many times we are praying for the prosperity of our bodies, but we, 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 we do not know that our souls are starving. Say, God, help my soul to prosper. May my soul prosper. And even as I hear from you today, feed my soul. Don't, don't just feed my head. Feed my soul. Feed my spirit. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place. And thank you, Lord, for all that you're going to do. Thank you for everyone in this room, for everyone watching online. We thank you because there is no distance in the spirit. We thank you because your word will go into our lives and refresh us in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'd like to say a big thank you to everybody who served um, yesterday. Served the women. Thank you so much for serving. I've heard praise reports. And um, I believe that some of the testimonies that emanated from that place were permanent in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well done. Well done for serving. It's a, it's a family. And I'm thankful to God for all that he's doing in this family of God. How many of you were blessed by last week's message? Wave your hands. Praise God for that. We've heard uh, testimonies. That message is available online. It's available on, the, on YouTube. If you're watching online, you can catch up if you missed it. Um, yeah, we're going to go into part two today. And I think I'll just ask us, how many of you love your family? I think uh, many people will love their family, uh, even though sometimes it's dysfunctional, but we love, we love our families. Uh, but the reality is that God loves your family more than you do. Yeah. God loves your family. God is highly interested in your family. And we, we highlighted that last week that God created family. Family is not your idea. Family is God's idea. We talked about the fact that at the beginning God created family and then God blessed family. He didn't just create family. He blessed family and he said be fruitful and multiply. And it's that blessing that enabled Adam and Eve to be able to thrive at the outset. It's that blessing that enabled Adam and Eve to carry out purpose. Yeah, to carry out God's mandate. And it's that same blessing that is still upon our lives today. And it's that same blessing that the enemy seeks to fight. Yeah, it's that same blessing. And that's why the, Satan continually attacks family with all kinds of issues, all kinds of troubles. Because he knows that if a child grows up in a safe atmosphere, in a sound atmosphere, that child can grow up to become anything for God. He can grow up to become anything in the kingdom. And so that's why childbearing is so crucial to the purpose of God. Yeah, so crucial. Yeah. And you see the enemy continues to attack family with divorce, with misunderstanding, with disobedience, with quarrels, with lack of unity, with negative patterns, all kinds of things. Yeah. But anyway, God has a lot to show us today, and I pray that we open our hearts to, to receive it. So, welcome again to week two. We're going to take our confession as we proceed in this message. Are you ready? Yes. You ready? Yes. Let's take it together. One, two, ready, go. Today, I'm humble enough to open my heart, my eyes, my ears, to let God's word reach me. I participate and listen with humility. I obey and practice what I hear in faith, because God is my friend. I'm receptive and fully attentive. To receive all that God has for me today in His Word. Amen. 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 We're going to read from the book of um, Timothy today, 2 Timothy. But before we read, um, when I was thinking about this, right before I became a pastor, my dad, who is, who is also a pastor, uh, told me, he was having like a kind of um, session to advise me, like a mentoring session, so to speak. He told me to go read the book of Timothy. And it's, and it's not like I'm up until that point, it's not like I had not read the book of Timothy before in the Bible. But when he told me, I, I picked up those books and I read it with a pair of fresh eyes and I learned a lot from it. It was like a new wave uh, was opened up unto me. The book of Timothy was written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, 
um, and he was actually addressing, it was a letter written to a young man called Timothy, by the name of the book, uh, who, is, who was his son, who is uh, Paul's son in the faith. Timothy was uh, Paul's so, um, protege, and, um, and he was also a leader in the Ephesian church. So Paul sent this personal letter to him just to encourage him as he leads the church, to strengthen him. But along the line, he mentions something. He, he tells um, Timothy to remember his family. He made a comment to his family. He, he, he spoke directly about, he reminds him of his connections to his biological family. So let's pick up from 2 Timothy 1, 1 to 5. Uh, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I have been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. I am writing to Timothy, my dear son. May God the Father and Son Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. Timothy, I thank God for you. The God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. And that's, that's fine. That's the one that caught my attention. I remember your genuine faith. Not a fake faith. A tested faith. A, a tried one. A lasting one. A strong one. A generational faith. I remember it. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother. Yeah, Louise. And your mother, Eunice. Eunice actually means better or more excellent. Yeah, I think there's somebody called Eunice in the house. Amen. <laughs> It's not a coincidence. And I know that that same faith continues strong in you. It continues strong in you. The topic of our message today is the power of training. The power of training. You may want to write that down if you're taking notes. The title of the message is The Power of Training. Now, how many of you have been to a very bad restaurant before? Uh. With your hands. Like you went to the restaurant and the food was very bad. The customer service was very bad. The atmosphere was very bad. Yeah. I think uh, many people have been there. Many people have been there. And sometimes when you walk into that kind of atmosphere, you make a decision that I will never come back here again. <laughs> Amen. Anyway, there's a very fantastic restaurant, uh, like, like a fast food restaurant in the U.S. It's called uh, Chick Fil A. Um, experts believe that by 2020, this restaurant is going to be larger than Burger King and than many, many, many restaurants. And the funny thing is that they don't even open on Sundays because the founder is a Christian, Truett Cathy, and she, he believes that. He doesn't want to open. He doesn't need to open the, the, the restaurant on Sunday because he wants people. He wants his employees, and he wants to go to church on Sunday. Yeah, the, the restaurant was founded in 1946, and over the years they've been able to maintain certain principles. One of the fantastic principles of these guys is their customer service and their training program. They have a very fantastic training program. Say, for instance, if you pick up somebody from that very bad restaurant that you went to. And, and put them in Chick-fil-A uh, in their system, in their training system, that person will excel a lot because they have a very sound training, training program. The training system is structured to teach their staff members extreme politeness. And if you walk up to uh, one of their staff members and um, maybe after they've served you, you tell them, thank you, they're going to tell you, they, they will always tell you, my pleasure. <laughs> always. That's, that's the way the training system has, uh, has been set up. And uh, the, the interesting thing is that by 90, uh, since 1973, these guys have spent $35 million, over $35 million in college scholarships just for their employees. That, that speaks volumes about their, about their, about their principles. The, the A, you know, Chick-fil-A, the A actually stands, stands for grade A. <laughs> I've tasted it before, I've experienced it before because I've had their sandwiches a few times whilst in the U.S. And that is what their training system is meant to deliver. And that speaks volumes about the power of training. Can you say the power of training? The power of training. And, and today I'm not just talking about training for staff members. I'm talking about training for life. I'm talking about training for the challenges of life. Training for godliness. Training for life. Yeah. And in the Bible, you see the word train several times. Uh, I think uh, you, you see it occur in a few places. But in most places where you occur, you see that um, it, it used to mean to depict, to train up, to train up somebody, to train up something. It also means to drill. It means to, to prepare for war. <laughs> Amen? Yeah, yeah it's used to, to, to depict more than just teaching something. It means it's used to depict the, the training of a child, the training up of a child to be, to be able to properly develop. 
especially moral and spiritual nature. So as we go forward in this message today, we are going to ask uh, two main points. Most times I don't give my points up front, but I'm going to give you the two main points for today so that you can write it down and they are in form of questions. The first one is good training, this is a question, good training, yeah, and then the second one would be bad training, question as well. First point, good training, good training. Uh, Proverbs 22 verse 6 says that, train up a child in the way he should go. Can we say it together? Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, it will not depart from it. I don't know if you have heard that Bible verse before. Like, people have said it several times. Yeah, thank you for your honesty. Many times when we read Proverbs 22 verse 6, we think the Bible is only talking about good training. Yeah. But for me, I picked up two things from that verse. The first one is that the verse is not only about good training. And that means that it's possible to be trained right and be negatively trained. And the second thing I picked up from that place is that the verse is not necessarily about children. Because there's a connection between how, an, how a child was raised and how they now manifest as an adult. Yeah, there's sometimes a connection. Not always, not every time, but all sometimes, most times. Yeah. So the question is that, could it be that many families have trained down people in our world today, instead of training them up? Could it be that um, many, many families have released people into the world who were not well trained? Could it be that you were trained to be insecure? What, what if you were trained to be insecure? What if you were trained to, be, to, not, not, to, not, to, honor, to not honor God? What, what if you were trained to be ungrateful? What if you were trained to disrespect? Could it even be that challenges of life have trained your heart to react in a particular way? Because I think that most times the shape of our heart is connected to the type of training we've got whilst growing up. Yeah. I believe that our society is training people the wrong things. Our society is training people the wrong way. Our society, for instance, is training people to chase fame. In fact, there was a study that showed that uh, the goal of every 10, of, an, of, of most 10 to 12 year olds is for them to be famous. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's, that's the training system in the society. It's all about the training. Can you say the power of training? Power of training. Yeah. And the, the reality is that the training we get sometimes is not based on the best out there. It's not always based on the best out there. It's based on the understanding and the wisdom of the people around us. And sometimes that can look as if it's the best. Yeah. Some of us actually got some certain trainings that we thought that was all. That was all that ever exists, so that is out there. For instance, many people think the church is judgmental, of course, and that's based on the, the context they, they experienced. But on the other hand, there's, there's a fantastic line of people experiencing life in God. Look at us here today on a Sunday morning experiencing life in God. Amen? Amen. Yeah, in an ideal world, this is how it should be. People should experience life in, in church. People should experience life in God. And some people have never experienced this. So because of what they've been trained to see, they have a limited view. Yeah, they have a limited view. And the big part of that, Proverbs 22, please bring it up again, Proverbs 22, verse 6, is the other part, which says that, and when he is old, it will not depart from it. Can you say, it will not depart from it? it will not depart from it. So there's a connection between how I was trained as a child and how I live now. Because I won't depart from it. Yeah. Could it be that the reason why it's difficult to depart from certain patterns is because you were trained along the line? Could it be? Yeah. See, many people are now, they are now adults. But because they've been trained in a certain way, it's very difficult for them to leave some patterns because it's now part of their identity, so to speak. That's why we must never for, forget that it is easier to teach a child than to unteach a man. Mm. Yeah, it's easier to teach a child. It's not impossible. It's easier to teach a child than to unteach a man. And the challenging thing about this is that everyone around us is training us in some way. Everybody around us, yeah. Yeah, social media, for instance, is training us. And that's why sometimes when we just scroll through the feeds, our mood just changes because we compare ourselves to other people. The things you watch, the people you listen to, the things you surround yourself with, those are your trainers. Those are your trainers. Actually, there was a time a woman wrote us a letter to, uh, to thank us. Yeah, she believes we've invested in our, in our children, our daughters. And she said that she's made a decision that every time the church opens, she wants our daughters to be here. That woman understands the power of training. I think many professionals understand the power of training. Yeah. And besides, we understand the power of training. Amen? Amen. Are we together? Yeah. We understand the power of training. How many of you would like to fly on a plane, maybe uh, that, that is driven or that is uh, piloted by somebody who is not trained? 
Let's say, for instance, the headline says, Today, we've got a trainee pilot who is in the first year of aviation school and it's going to be it's going to be flying you to New York today. Sit back, relax. <laughs> Some of you will run away from that plane. <laughs> Amen. Would you give your child to a doctor who is not well trained? No. no. Health practitioners know this very well. And so what happens is that weekly, some of them have like training programs. So some time ago, I was on the train and I saw one of our members who is a physiotherapist on the train. And I said, how was your day? She said, I went to training. Yeah, so all day she was in training and they paid for, they paid for that day. Yeah, yeah, so there's power in training. There's power in training. Said, there's power in training. Power in training. Right, so to amplify this, I want to look at um, a family that mirrors this in the Bible as highlighted in our text. And let's go back to 2 Timothy 1.5. 2 Timothy 1.5. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first fueled your grandmother, Louise, and your mother, Eunice. And I know that the same faith continues strong in you. Louis and Eunice, those, those, those are names that some of us have probably not heard in the Bible before, not seen in the Bible before. We might, have, we might have heard them, but people probably have not seen them in the Bible before. There's only one mention of, of those names in the Bible. One mention. And when it's mentioned, it's in reference to something good. You know, sometimes you mention some people's names and as, as you hear that name, you run away because there's something <laughs> negative about the name. But these two characters are people who understand the power of training. Yeah, they understand the importance of training. Louis was the grandmother of Timothy, and uh, Eunice was the mother of Timothy. And when you see that, uh, when you see as Paul writes, he, he mentions the faithfulness of these two people. Where was um, the father of Timothy? Many scholars believe that the father was an unbeliever. And so he was not in the equation when these two ladies were training the boy and leading him up to be like Christ in the right ways. And it's even funny because in those days, it was uncommon for men's, women's names to be mentioned in most times. But yet, when Paul writes, he mentions the name of, those, of these two people because of the impact that they had in that young, young man's life. Yeah. And when you look at the book of 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 15, that godly training is referenced again. Let's see, let's see there. 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 15. But you must remain faithful. This is Paul talking to Timothy. You must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. Yeah, you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those. Now, Paul is talking about the godly mother and the godly grandmother again, Eunice and Louis. Yeah, you can, you, you, you know you, you can trust those who taught you. Yeah. You have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting Jesus. How many times can we see taught there? We can see taught. Let me read it again. I want you to count. You have been taught. Amen? Let's go back. Sorry, 14. Verse 14. But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. Can you say one? Yeah. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. Two. You have been taught in the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they, are, they, have been giving to the, they, have, they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus. You have been taught. You have been taught. You have been taught. You have been trained. And how did they do it? They did it through the things they said to Timothy. They did it through the things they exposed him to. They did it through the places they took him to. They did it through their own personal example. They did it through the word of God. I think Louis and Eunice are powerful examples of influence in the life of a young person. Yeah. And uh, what they prove is that every good training is intentional. Every good training is intentional. And that tells me that success is not accidental. I I've, I've never seen anybody who has been successful in life, and then you walk up to them and ask them, that, how, how did you do it? And they tell you that, I didn't know how I got there. <laughs> I didn't know how I did it. It's never happened. Success is intentional. And I think that many personal testimonies would include things like, my mommy taught me hard work. My, my grandmother took me to church. My, my sibling will do this for me. I mean, we can have testimonies like that. Like you could say that maybe my mother, my grandmother did something that inspired me to live in a certain way. Yeah, I know many people here have that, that kind of testimony. Personally, um, I actually wrote a book about the influence my parents had on me uh, growing up. I've written that book. I've written three editions of that book. It's called The Pastor's Son. It's available online on Amazon. Uh, it's, called, it's, it's basically real life stories of the experience that I had growing up. The pastor's son, real life stories and lessons from a church pastor's son. Yeah. And uh, 
I've, I've highlighted to us that I grew up in a, in, a, in a home that was not perfect. I mentioned that last week. But in the book, I shared how love was modeled for me growing up, how faith was modeled, how unity was modeled, how prayer was modeled, how I followed my dad to preaching engagements and all those kind of things. Powerful influence. And what has happened over the, over the, the few months and whatever that I've been a parent is that it's becoming real. It's becoming real. Those experiences are becoming real. I personally believe that you don't, you don't know the impact of how you were raised until you are in a position to raise somebody else. That's, that's what I believe. Yeah. And so many people would parent, many people would lead with, with the wrong training in mind because that's all they ever knew. That's all they, they ever saw. And sometimes we can defend what is wrong because that's all we know. Yeah. So the Apostle Paul in our text recognizes the, the importance of training, the power of training. He looks at it, he recognizes the life changing contributions of these two women, Eunice and Louis, in a day that women were really mentioned by name. Yeah, he honored their impact. Can you say amen? amen? Yeah. And I think that should that should encourage grandmothers and mothers in the house. That should encourage you that your seeds are impo important. Every little step you take is important. Can you say amen? amen? Every little step you take is important. Every step you take it's important. Now, Louis and Eunice were not perfect. Amen? Amen. Are we together? Amen. Louis and Eunice were not perfect. And it was not a perfect family. Yeah, because Timothy's dad was not even present. Because they could have had an excuse not to raise up this child the right way. Are we together? Yeah. yeah. But they were still there. They were still there to, to give their best. And I think that should encourage you as a mother. That should encourage you as you kneel down in the morning to pray for your children. That should encourage you as you live in purity for one day when you will meet your spouse. That should encourage you as you step out in faith to lead your child to be like Christ. Yeah. And the reality is that we, we don't all have to raise up pastors like Timothy, but we can raise up our children to be world changers and to be kingdom people in every step they take. Amen. Amen. Let's talk about the second point, bad training, bad training. I think um, there may be people here who are asking a question, what do I do if I've been wrongly trained? Because we've talked about good training so far. What do I do if I've, if I've been wrongly trained? Maybe I've been wrongly trained by my family or situations or the people around me. I personally believe that most times, most times people don't set out to say, now, I'm going to train my children the bad way, as in most times. There may be people who do that, but I think most times people don't say that, now, I'm going to give birth to a child, and I'm going to deliberately destroy the person's life. I don't think most times people set out to do that. Sometimes it's just basically unintentional. It's little decisions, it's ignorance, it's uh, mistakes, it's, it's, it's lack, it's delays, it's issues. But if you were wrongly trained, and even following last week's message, maybe you've identified one or two mistakes or issues around you. If we're wrongly trained or you've identified defects around you, I want you to know that there is still hope. Can you say amen? amen. There is still hope. And this is, what, this is what this series is all about. It's not a series where we just want to throw out people's issues and just fly it in their eyes so that they can remember. It's to give you hope and to give you peace. And this is what Jesus is all about. What is the point if we just remind ourselves of the issues of life, the issues we are facing, and then there's no hope, there's no solution. Yeah. And I think that's what the enemy is all about. The enemy wants, he wants us to have a wrong view of life so that we don't even try, so that we don't even step out in faith. He wants us to have a wrong view of the past we've had, the trainings we've had, so that we don't step out in faith to believe God for, for so many things. I think the enemy will do two things to keep people bound. Two things. The first one is that he will keep people perpetually bound in a position of situational depression. Situational depression. It, it wants people to stay stuck in that particular situation so that they cannot even see ahead of them. They cannot see the future. It wants to keep people depressed, oppressed, ignorant, perplexed. What is depression? Depression is, is a common mental disorder that causes people to, to experience loss of interest or loss of pleasure. They have feelings of guilt. They have a low self-esteem, low self-worth. They stop sleep. They stop appetite low energy and poor concentration. In fact, there's, uh, there's been some studies that show that there is a connection between depression and social media. In fact, there was a, there was a, there was a graph somewhere that, that showed that with the emergence of every new iPhone, you could see the rate of depression rising up. 
like you could see going up, going up, going up. Yeah. According to the World Health Organization, depression will be the second leading cause of world disability by 2020. That's next year. Amen? Yeah. So there's, 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 there are different kinds of depression. There's clinical depression. There is uh, all kinds of depression. But I'm talking about situational depression. There are experts out there to deal with clinical depression and so many things. So that's the first thing the enemy will do to keep you bound. The second one is that there will be lack of engagement. Can you say lack of engagement? Lack of engagement. Yeah, so you avoid full engagement. You know, sometimes people, even, people are even listening to God's word, they are not engaging with the word of God. Lack of engagement. Some people don't even want to try anymore. Some people have given up on life. It's now all about survival. Survival. Just, just to survive. See, life is not just about survival. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Life is not just about survival. It's about using what you have left Regardless of the wrong training, regardless of the upbringing, it's about using what you have left. The miracle is ahead of you based on what you have left. It's not in what you lost. It's not in your past. It's in what you have left. How I many of you have something left? You have hope left. You have your life left. You have the gift of life left. It's in what you have left. Yeah. The reality is that, the reality is that if you've had a wrong training, but another reality is that there is still something that God could use to make a new life, to bring forth life and life in abundance. Can you say there is still hope? There is still hope. Let's say it emphatically. There is still hope. There is still hope. Yeah. Let's see Psalm 18 verse 24. Psalm 18, Psalm 18 verse 24 says that God rewrote the text of my life. God rewrote the text of my life when I opened the book of my heart to his eyes. God rewrote the text of my life. God is a, God is, God is a writer. He can rewrite people's stories. God can rewrite your story. That's the way I say it. God can rewrite your story when you give him the pen. Yeah. But know that, know that there's always a process to this. There's always a process. And what happens is that the rewriting would start only when you hand over the pen to him. Yeah. That's, that's when the rewriting starts. Psalm, Psalm 18 verse 20 says it this way. God made my life complete. God made my life complete when I placed all the pieces before him. When I placed all the pieces before him. So you were wrongly trained. Some of you are here. You, are, you were wrongly trained. You were wrongly um, led. That is the reality. But you can be retrained. That's another reality. Yeah. And there's, there's no other person. There's no better person to do this than Jesus. I feel like I'm speaking to one person specifically. There's no other person. There's no better person that can do it than Jesus. He's the best trainer. He will pick you up and put you back together again. Can you say amen? amen? And that's what God does with this church. That's what God does with the word of God. The word of God is a powerful medium for training. John 8 verse 32 says that uh, you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. God's word is a powerful medium for training. Yeah. God's word is truth. So the, the key to victory in family problems is, is not Exercising more willpower, exercising more willpower, trying. It's, that's, not the, that's not the key. It's not trying. It's not trying, but it's in drawing strength from God moment by moment. It's, it's in drawing strength from God's word moment by moment, day by day. And that is what God does. That's what God does to, to us through His Spirit. That's what God does to us through His, His Spirit. So let me break it to us today because some of you have, have excluded yourself from this point, from this message. See, the reality is that we all need God's training. We all need God's training, everybody, irrespective of whether you had good training or bad training, uh, good background or bad background, we all need God's training because we were trained by imperfect parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were trained by imperfect people. So we all need training from God. We all need direct, direct address from God because he's the only perfect one. Amen. In fact, uh, Timothy, uh, Paul said this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 8. He said, physical training is good. Training to be a doctor is good. Training, training as exercise is good. Training by men is good. Training to be a physiotherapist is good. Training to be a lawyer is good. But training for godliness is much better. Can we say that together? Training for godliness, training for godliness. is much better. Much better. Why is it much better? Because it promises benefit in this life and in the life to come. It promises benefit in this life and in the life to come. So whether we were trained by good parents or bad parents, I think the reality is that we, we all feel inadequate sometimes. I mean, this week I, I, I felt inadequate in so many, so many ways, so many areas. Because sometimes we all feel inadequate. It's the reality of life. Trained by good parents, 
in a good home where they had money or not, in a good home where you had a good example or not, we all feel inadequate sometimes. So far from comparison, we all have negative influences around us and we all need God daily. Yeah, we, we can never outgrow our need for God. Never. We can never outgrow our need for God. Yeah. And this is, this is where I usually say that, uh, you see, running, running away from God is a race we can never win. Yeah, it's a race we can never win. Yeah. So I believe that today, God wants to reposition somebody. God wants to reposition somebody. He wants to set somebody on the right track. So you can start building the right foundation for life. Amen. Yeah. So whether you have good training or bad training, we all need we all need God. We all need God. So a right foundation in God is the place to start for freedom from family problems from bad training from bad upbringing and all that so perhaps you are here or you are online and you're thinking that uh, all this does not concern me i'd like you to think again mm -hmm. yeah think again everything around us is training us in some way mm. people around us training us in some way friends training us in some way yeah but the best form of training is only available in christ so again if you've been wrongly trained maybe because of an experience or a situation if you've been wrongly programmed if you've been wrongly affected by things that happened along the line, things that popped up last week, yeah, the things that popped up, this is a continuation, things that popped up last week, I want you to know that God wants to retrain you. God specializes in retraining people. Yeah, and that's what he does through the help of the Holy Spirit. We are trained in righteousness to become like Christ. And that is, that is what, that's what, the, that's what the church is all about. The bulk of the church is to retrain us. In fact, Timothy, uh, Paul says it to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.15. He says that this is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and foundation of truth. It's the pillar and foundation of truth. So you, you can start again. You can, you can start again. I think what happens is that uh, most times when we, when we hear God's word, sometimes the enemy tells us that there's a fraud within us. There's a fraudulent person within us. And that's why sometimes you see that when we make an altar call sometimes, People raise their some people raise their hands every week. How many of you have seen that before? Like people raise their hands every week because they, there's that feeling inside us that we are inadequate. But when once you give your life to Jesus, you raise up your hand. It's a process, and God begins to walk in over and over again. Even though you are inadequate, it's a training. A training program is not just something you do for one hour. It's something that is over time, and that's what many professionals will tell you. You don't do a training today and then stop next year. It is consistent. So the greatest trainer is Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Amen. He will train you and make you fit consistently. It's a journey. It's, it's not a one-day affair. It's a journey. It, walking with God is a process. It, it's, not, it's not a one-day affair. Most times, we all just want to go into a place where they will tell us that all your problems will go instantly. You can have a solution to a physical problem and still be sick on the inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, but it's a process. And that's where healing comes from. I'm, I'm not here today in this series. I'm not here to give you a magic formula to the, to the solution of the problems of your family. Mm. But I'm here to give you Jesus. Amen. Because when you have Jesus, you have life. Can you say amen? amen. amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And it's a challenge of the world. It's a challenge of the world that sometimes we've gone through a system, we've gone through a training that has taken 10 years, 20 years to be manufactured. And we just want to step into a day and just eradicate everything. But God is a God of process. God is a God of process. Yeah. Yeah. So fathers, you may not have had a perfect picture of a father growing up, a perfect trainer growing up. You may not have had a, had a picture of a dad. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes when we worship God, I will call God a good, good father. Some people cannot relate with it. Because every time you mention father, they remember that father that was not there growing up. Or that issue they had with the father somewhere. Or even when you say that uh, you can be a good mother, some people don't even believe it. Because they've seen a model somewhere. So mothers... You may not have had a perfect picture of a mother, but you have everything in Jesus. Amen. Yeah, children, you may not have had people model things to you in some ways. And I think the, the challenge is that sometimes we're trained in some ways, and we're not trained in some ways. You were trained well in some ways. You could see a child who knows how to handle finances very well, but doesn't know how to handle a lady. You could see somebody who knows how to, who knows how to run for career and just keep going, but they don't have wisdom to manage situations. So it's, it's, it's not perfect. Yeah, and that's why we need Jesus. We all need Jesus. Amen. 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 Uh, as I try to round off this um, this message, you know, in the in the Mr. and Mrs. series last year, I mentioned that um, 
sometimes when I walk around places or when people see me, they, they tell me that you can do what you can do or what you're doing because of the place you grew up in, because of the experience you had growing up, um, because of your father and all those kind of things. And I tell them, yes, that's true, but that's partly true. Mm. Because my, my dad um, grew up in a, in a polygamous home. My granddad had many wives. So he didn't have, my daddy had a picture of a perfect father. So he could have said, okay, I'm going to continue this line. I'm just going to marry five wives. I'll just have fun and just enjoy myself. <laughs> yeah. But he made a decision along the line to give his life to Jesus and to rewrite the order of things in his family. So through him, his father gave his life to Jesus. And his father also even gave the church, my dad's church, a plot of land to start a church in their town. And so every year now, my dad goes there to preach. Uh, he goes to there to do a big crusade for the community. Yeah. And then you could see that that impact, that, that decision, I mean, has emanated into the lives of the children and the family to the point that many of them have not made a decision to follow Jesus. And that's what happens with decisions. Yeah, that's what happens with decisions. Our decisions can change thing, things. Yeah, our decisions can, take, can change things. I think with our decisions, we can build a legacy of faith or a legacy of pain. Yeah, we can build a legacy of freedom for our family. Or a legacy of, of pain. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the thing is that I think sometimes many of us are living in regrets, in, uh, in, 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 in some of the things that, that happened to us. But see, the reality is that we don't get to decide the family we're going to. We don't get to decide that. We don't get to decide what happens at birth. But we get to decide what happens now. Yeah. We, we get to decide what happens now. Yeah. You get to decide whether you, go, you join God's family or not. So what God wants today is that He wants to welcome you. He wants to welcome you to His family, yeah. Amen. And that's what He wants you to do with a decision for Him, a decision for Him. So when we make a decision for Jesus, it affects the now, but it also affects the future. It affects the future of the people around us, and it affects everybody around us. Amen. 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 Let's bow down our heads as we as we pray together. Uh, I'd like you to take some time to meditate in prayer today. Take some time to to meditate in prayer today. Your decision is what determines your destiny. Good training or bad training or whatever, whatever it is, it's your decision that determines your destiny. Somebody once said that uh, you, you were born looking like your daddy or your mother, but you died looking like your decisions. You died looking like your decisions. So if you're here today, you're watching online, God wants you to make a decision. That is what ministry, that's what we do. That's what pastors do, just pushing people to make decisions. Make decision, make decision. I think the challenge with us sometimes as human beings is that we make a decision today and tomorrow we move away. Somebody said the challenge of ministry is that uh, when, you, when you lead people to make a decision, they make a decision in the moment and then the enemy deceives them later. So that's why you see that sometimes many people want to, many ministers want to give up because, in fact, I heard somebody say that uh, he, one time he had a dream job and his dream job was to go and stack boxes in the factory. Because he knows that if he stack boxes and he moves those boxes, they will move and, it's, and they will stay moved. But the challenge with us as human beings is that we make a decision today and we give up. But God, God wants to give you the grace today to make a decision that will be life changing, lifelong, and it will breath peace and joy in your home and all around you. So take some time today to talk to God about um, your training, what you've been through, your upbringing, your life. Let's take some time also to pray for the kids upstairs. Every step we take is showing them something. And this is not a series for just uh, married people or young people or kids, about kids, about parenting. It's a series for all of us. We are all modeling and training some people in some way. So let's pray, let's pray for our, our, our connect kids and pray that uh, the life of God will be upon them. God will surround them with the right people. He will surround them with the right situations. Surround our children with the right people.
eyes still closed, if you if you're here today, I want to make a, I want to make a call. If you're here today and um, you you've identified some of the defects in terms of the way you were trained, in terms of the way you were raised. Um, I just want to actually pray with you. I just want to touch you. With, I believe I believe God wants you to touch you. So if you've identified it, a, a a defect in the way you were trained, maybe it just kept on popping up to you and it just keeps coming back. I'd like you to raise up your right hand. Um, as eyes closed, I'd like you to raise up your hand. I want to honor this moment and honor that God is here. Jesus name we pray. Father I thank you for your church. Thank you for the life in this place. Thank you for the people in this place. Thank you for the, the people that have received your word today. It's simple but it's potent. It's powerful because your word is powerful. The Bible says the entrance of the word of God gives life and understanding to the simple. It is simple but it is potent in the name of Jesus. And the decisions that have been made today are permanent in the name of Jesus. The enemy will not deceive you again in the name of Jesus. When the enemy shall come in like a flood. The spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray.